For such a little man in stature, the shadow cast on Formula One by Bernie Ecclestone is immense. Love him or hate him, with many more being in the second camp, his influence on Formula One is unparalleled, and it's not an exaggeration to say that without him, we would have a much different sport, if it even existed at all. His was the vision that took Formula One, once the domain of men covered in grease and oil, caring little about anything other than racing, into the global limelight, transforming a mostly European operation into a broadcasting behemoth covering the whole globe. Today on the show, we have the story of the one and only Bernie Eccleston. You may have noticed that we've taken a break over the past month. That was to catch up on converting old episodes to video, which can now be found on YouTube, as well as changing the format of the show moving forward. This is exciting not only because of the content we have to share, but we also have some new voices to be heard. This story is the first episode from a new contributor to Garage East Radio. Flip Jacobson originally wrote this piece on Mr. E for the Formula One subreddit's off-season history project, and he's here to share his excellent writing and research with us. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. Let's dive into Mr. Ecclestone's history. So let's get down to it. This is Garage East Radio. Thanks for tuning in. locked up his tyres, got the line, and he's back into second position on the last lap but one, and the French crowd aren't very happy. Now, I hope no one will mind, but we're going to fly through the early years and pick up Bernie's story as the used car salesman is already dabbling in racing, since the story of his early years aren't that much different from a lot of struggling young men at Britain at the time. That being said, there are a few passages that bear mentioning. Bernie got his first job in a small motorcycle shop just before his 18th birthday. Uh, Bernie was making his way, dealing with anything and everything using that famous brain of his, and he started dealing with in used motorcycles. He actually ended up selling one to Mr. Jack Surtees, who raced motorcycles, and his young son John was there to pick up the bike. And just a few months later, he was already in a bigger shop. This one sold cars and bikes. Before his 21st birthday, his name was already on the, on the shop, it was Compton and Ecclestone, and they had to move to motorcycles only. Once he had some money in his pocket, Bernie tried his hand in motorcycle racing, that's what he was selling, but he decided it was too dangerous, so he moved over to cars, and he even took part in a support race for Formula One's first race in Silverstone in 1950. And Bernie would race on and off, he wasn't a regular racer because he was always working and dealing, but in 53 he had a crash in Brands Hatch and killed a spectator and that was the end of his racing career. Towards the end of the 1950s, Bernie's businesses were thriving and he had become a known businessman in his area, but one that kept on going back out to the Brands Hatch racetrack whenever he could. In one of his outings, he met and befriended Stuart Lewis Evans, who was starting out his career as a Grand Prix racing driver. Bernie clearly saw in Stuart some of the things that he wanted to be. Stewart was a successful racing driver, he had beaten Moss and Tony Brooks, he had lapped at Reims, an old French track, within a fifth of a second from Fangio. He was clearly a, a very talented racing driver. Bernie decided to help his career along, you know, this guy was a friend of his now. And so Connaught, the manufacturer for which Stewart was racing, they were in serious trouble, for you know, financial trouble, and in early 57, they lost their backer. So Bernie bought two of their cars and sent them off to the New Zealand Grand Prix, it was a big deal at the time, with Stewart and Roy Salvadori as drivers. Stewart didn't finish the race, he had an oil pressure problem, and Salvadori finished fifth. 
But Bernie's intention for sending the cars there were, was actually for them to race and then sell the cars down in New Zealand, bring back profit, and Bernie could you know, get along with that. But apparently Stewart was hopeless in uh, deals and negotiating, and when he sent the offer he had had back to Bernie, it was for way less than Bernie wanted. So the cars came back home, and Bernie had two race cars. Yeah, so after that initial race, he kept racing them for a few races, that's right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Bernie even raced it once in, uh, in Monaco, uh, but he failed to qualify. But yeah, Bernie kept the cars, they raced it a few more times, uh, and Bernie wanted to build a, a team, a Formula One team, around Stewart. But Stewart was hired by Van Wall uh, around that time, and you know, there, there made no sense for him to jump back into a startup team. And, you know, Bernie just settled into being Stewart's agent, a job that, you know, he wouldn't hold for long, unfortunately. In October 1958, Stewart had an accident at the Moroccan Grand Prix and later died of severe burns suffered. The Van Wall team owner lost his heart for Formula One, and that was that. Bernie left Formula One alone for a while concentrating on his businesses. That was until he began circulating around racetracks again in the mid-60s, meeting a young Austrian by the name of Jochen Rent, with whom Bernie developed a quick friendship. Bernie admired his racing skills, and Rent admired Bernie's business acumen, so they got along rather well. Um, well, Colin Chapman wanted to take Rent away from Brabham, and Rent told him to deal with Bernie, and Bernie would negotiate in his, in his place. They were, they had become friends uh, in, in a sense. When Rint did this, it kind of established that, you know, if you wanted Jochen, you went to, through Bernie. At the same time, Bernie had suggested that Rint set up an, his own Formula 2 team, which was not unheard of at the time. Of course, Bernie was, was going to run the team. And Jochen Rint Racing was born in January of 1970. Rint had uh, uh, was going to leave Brabham. It was, it was negotiated that he would move over to drive for Chapman. Jack Brabham at this point was already out of the picture. He had uh, gone back to Australia. And his partner, Ron Tarnanak, had kept Brabham going. But Brabham was in trouble. And once Tarnanak told Jakin that he was having trouble with money, you know, Jochen suggested that he might know a person who could help him out and maybe buy the team. Unfortunately, as with Stuart Lewis Evans, the Bernie Jochen pair was a partnership that would end tragically, as Rent was killed that same year, 1970, in Monza. Still, Bernie was in to buy the Brabham operation, although the first round of negotiations didn't go well as they were far too apart in terms. But after Rent's death, Taranak was looking for an out, so he made one more offer for Bernie, allowing him to buy the team for £100,000, even after they had previously agreed to pay one thirty. Taranak was not a very shrewd businessman and took the offer. Bernie had his racing team. Now that Bernie is in charge of Brabham, um, who at the time were, were decently competitive, they finished fourth in the 1970 championship, what did he do with the team at that time? Well, Brabham as a company, it wasn't only the, the team at the time. They had a lot of different projects going on. They were even producing road cars. They built Formula 2 cars, they built Formula 3 cars. Obviously, they had a Formula 1 team. But, you know, no one cared about, you know, the books and making sure they were making enough money to do this and do that. So once Bernie got in to Brabham, his managing style was dictatorship, and he kept it all going, you know, with an iron fist. Um, he was already known to be a very tough businessman. He was quite well known for, you know, kind of forgetting bits of negotiations that didn't favor him, and he would just forget about it and just move over. No matter how many people he crossed, no matter how many people might have a problem with him or anything like that, he just kept pushing. The thing is, Brabham's parent company, uh, was called Motor Racing Development Limited, kept growing. Bernie revolutionized everything. He made it professional, he made it neat, and he just made sure, you know, hummed along and it kept growing and growing. 
at one point he fired the entire design team and he just kept one man which a 24 year old from South Africa called uh, Gordon Murray we would you know hear from him quite a bit later on but he just he transformed the whole team the, the whole factory was changed everything was neat uh, everything was organized uh, he, he even made sure that he had the whole place painted white and it had to remain spotless he made sure that the, the, the pathways from building to building were better organized so people wouldn't lose time going from place to place. Everything was now neatly uh, laid out like you would see in a, in a Formula One garage now, you know, where everything has a place and everything is stored neatly. Um, for Brabham, that was burning, you know, before it was just a huge mess and everything was scattered. And once he got in, um, it became a really organized operation. and. It showed. Being the owner of the Brabham team was more than just running the team. He also got a coveted position um, on FICA. So what what did that entail for Bernie? At that at that point, you know, they had uh, FICA, which uh, at that point that was they called the Formula One Constructors Association, and that's I think if I had to to make a guess, that's when Bernie probably saw the opportunity to run the whole show because it was a completely disorganized mess. No one was interested in running it. They all just wanted to go racing and that's it. And as a team owner, Bernie had a seat in that association. I, you know, I, I can't imagine how surprised he was when he saw how the, the whole thing was run. And I can't imagine him not looking at this and, and thinking, you know, I'm gonna run this thing and this is gonna be mine. Now, before we go any further, we need to understand the Formula One landscape that Brabham was getting into with Bernie behind it. At this point, money was extremely hard to come by for anyone not named Ferrari or Lotus. Sponsorship usually meant free tires, gas, and other incidentals. Tracks routinely stiffed the teams on fees they were promised, and teams took extra cars to try and collect more money, therefore reducing the loss, even if their third or fourth cars were completely crap. Enzo Ferrari famously derided the garagistas of the area, comparing them to children playing with their toy cars. Of course, having the garagistas around helped increase the number of cars regularly taking part in the GPs, but most of them were operating at a loss and would come and go constantly, only reinforcing the establishment's view that they were expendable. So how did that association come to be? What was it tasked with? If you move back to Formula 2, the English teams formed a group where the one person from the group would speak for everyone. And, you know, the, the idea kind of moved up to Formula One, and that's how FICA was, was born, basically. Uh, FICA just took care of transportation costs in the beginning. Uh, it was not very important. But forming it was a first step for the teams, especially the, the smaller British outfits. Uh, that, that was the first step they took into the political arena. Uh, back then, for each Grand Prix, each organizer, they had the power to put in whatever rules they chose. Um, obviously, this was going to, to become a problem at some point, and it did. And interestingly, in the first Grand Prix that Bernie took part as Bradman owners, the Monaco Grand Prix of 1972. Right, and there is a huge political storm that kind of came to a head at that Grand Prix. So what was that? By the time they, they came to Monaco for the 72 Grand Prix, the Automobile Club de Monaco, they wanted 22 cars on the grid, not 26. And back then, you know, taking part in a race was pretty important for the teams. That's how they got part of their money. And they they had no care about, you know, there was no difference between 26 or 22. They just wanted to kind of, you know, put their foot down and remind the teams that they were the ones calling the shots. But they couldn't really believe that the teams joined up and refused to take part in the race unless 26 cars could race. Um, even the, the Matra team, the French team, joined the protest. And, you know, people start filling up the stands, and this is Monaco, and the cars are still locked away by the Monaco police because, the, you know, this had gone over to, you know, calling the cops. And the FIA representative is trying to bargain with the teams that, you know, oh, we can start practice and then we settle this. And the teams were flatly refusing. And who was leading, who was speaking for the teams? Bernie. 
And he refuses to join practice and says that all the teams are not going to join practice until they have a signed document that 26 cars will race. The, the FIA person tries to, to kind of wail out, you know, saying, oh, you know, but the person that can sign that is not here, I'm going to bring it. And Bernie's like, well, no, I don't care. We're not taking part in practice. And, you know, the hour is getting late. 30 minutes later, Bernie is in one of his cars and the teams have their signed paper. And this, remember, is the first race he showed up as the owner of a team. So he was already taking charge. And in one race, Bernie is basically the political face of the team association. But Colin Chapman's man still ran FICA. So Bernie kept a low profile until a meeting later that year, during the South African GP, where transportation costs were due to be discussed. Well, you know, there's this official presentation for sorting out the transportation costs. And after the official presentation, Bernie shows up and he gives each team uh, representative a sealed envelope with his proposal for the transportation costs. That proposal would save each team about 5,000 pounds per race. And, you know, remembering that these guys are not the wealth from the teams that we have today, so 5,000 pounds per race, it would be pretty, uh, pretty relevant. And the only thing that Bernie forgot to mention was that he had agreed with a transportation company where he got a little bit of the money out of that deal for himself. But since the teams were always strapped for cash, everyone took his offer. And he had another proposition, which everyone accepted uh, gladly. He would now negotiate with the organizers on behalf of all the teams and, you know, he would get a small 2% of the prize fund for his troubles. And this was a suggestion by a, the owner of the March team, a gentleman by the name of Max Mosley. Um, you know, in those days, 2% of the prize fund was not going to be uh, a lot of money. But this is Bernie. So in a few years, he's up to 8%. But uh, by the time this meeting in South Africa is over, basically everyone loves Bernie. And he is entrusted with the political power to represent all of them. You know, this is basically Bernie taking over Formula One. In a few years, Bernie would buy the transport company he had agreed on a deal with, close it, and set up his own company, Fika World Travel, to monopolize the air travel and hotel accommodation business wherever Formula One was in town. Bernie is clearly kind of making these political moves. Did the other team owners or managers how do they feel about this political maneuvering? Did they even take note of it or were any opposed to it? Um, not really. Um, most of the team managers really, they had no interest in negotiating anything, uh, you know, transportation costs and pit assignments or anything like that, um, hotels. No, everyone was glad Bernie was taking care of it. Uh, famously, Peter War, who ran Lotus, he, uh, he was quoted saying that, you know, if he had to negotiate with the 14 race organizers and figure out how to get his cars to each race and everything, he would just quit. So they had no interest in this. They just wanted to race. They were racing people, but, you know, Bernie was a racing person, obviously, but he also liked business and he was probably you know, more, more interested in business than anything else. So every team was fine with it, and this was more than fine with Bernie because you know he knew that this is how he would basically run the whole show. So the teams were happy to to let Bernie do his business, but apparently the the FIA and race organizers not so much. So in 1972, after Monaco and after South Africa, things start to get a little bit dicey between those two. So what was happening between Bernie, race organizers, and the FIA? Well. Late in 72, uh, the race organizers, they, they had realized what was going on and they were in panic. You know, Bernie was demanding that race prizes be upped. Um, basically, he wanted from 5,000 pounds, they, he wanted to take it to 90,000 pounds. That was his, the, his request. Um, and then the, the, the FICA would determine how to divide that money between the teams since they represented the teams. Um, so GPI, the Grand Prix International, they hired these Swiss and German negotiators to deal with Bernie. And, you know, the, 
they irritated Bernie, Bernie irritated them, it was never going to work. You know, they tried to move one way, Bernie wanted to take everything the other. Uh, they were just jockeying for positioning and uh, GPI made a deal with Graham Hill. Um, so that's how he got his own team, you know, he would be GPI's poster boy for what, you know, in quotes, you know, the good team owner. Um, meanwhile, Bernie was behind his back, uh, trying to make the engine supplier join Fika and not give Hill an engines for his team. And, you know, this back and forth just kept going. Well, you know, sponsors are already involved. Uh, this is, you know, 72, 73. So Philip Morris Europe, Formula One's biggest sponsor, was clearly not happy with what was going on. And so between 72 and 73, during the winter, they basically told everyone to stop what they were doing, and unless they sorted out their differences, they are basically going to pull their money. Um, FIA got involved and gave in to Bernie. That's one moment where you know, we get another piece of the puzzle, um, because uh, FIA told Max Mosley that they refused to deal with Bernie, and uh, an alternative person would have to be found. And, you know, this is how Max Mosley Marge team owner becomes Max Mosley. He quickly jumps on that opportunity, starts dealing directly with the FIA, Bernie is out, um, the GPI quickly disappears, um, and race prices go up. The purse, average purse from 5,000 pounds and change goes up to almost 70,000 pounds. And the FICA gets to determine how that money is distributed. Here we go. This is Bernie's another piece of the puzzle for Bernie's power. You know, he's now the one uh, responsible for giving money to the teams. Bernie is now the de facto leader of uh, FICA. Uh, there's no question, no one questions him anymore. And, you know, his peculiar negotiation styles um, are, now, uh, are now in place. You know, uh, I'm go always going to win. I'm going to win by as much as I can. And, you know, if it's, uh, if I have to scorch the earth to get what I want, so be it. And with the teams making more money and racing and uh, getting everything they wanted, you know, Bernie was just left to, to run the whole thing. So even having to settle after the Philip Morris threat of, of leaving the sport, the organizers are still probably pretty upset with Bernie. So how do they try to get back with him after the Philip Morris scare? Yeah, well, the organizers were, were clearly not happy. You know, they they're now uh, they needed to find more money to to pay the the race fee. So that's how the the limiting number of entries for uh, each Grand Prix started. You know, from the Monaco Grand Prix of uh, seven four onwards, the organizers now started limiting the number of entries. Smaller teams would be hurt, obviously. Um, the organizers said it was for safety. Uh, but this was obviously a way uh, to deal out less money to the teams and not have to come up with as much money as they, uh, they thought would be uneconomical for each race. However, the organizers did not realize that this gave extra power to Bernie. He promised that the FICA teams would show up with at least 18 cars every race, paying a penalty equal to half the purse money if they didn't. Sounds counterproductive, right? Mm, not at all. It actually made Bernie's transportation packages even more paramount, as teams not getting to the races would have to pay extra. Remember when we said a while back that Bernie's mind was always just going much faster than everyone else's? Well, this is just another example. He was making more money, he was getting more power, and he was making the organizers a little less annoyed at him. It was really brilliant. Now, it's easy to see Mr. E as this wheeling and dealing cutthroat businessman, which, to be fair, makes up a great deal of his persona. But Bernie had a soft side as well, and not a lot of people knew about it. Um, yeah, uh, Bernie, you know, obviously, we, we all know the businessman Bernie, but he, he was not um, a person who was all bad by any means. Uh, when Joachim was killed at Monza, for instance, um, Chapman just cut and run, he just left, and Bernie took care of everything, you know, he dealt with the police, he, he had to figure out a way to get Nina Rind, you know, his, his wife, 
back home and how how you get the, the body back home. Obviously, uh, Bernie he he would do this in in every case. He denied doing anything. He said that you know people handled everything and he had nothing to do with it. When Frank Williams had his accident. Um, in France, and the French doctors wanted to actually. The French doctors wanted to turn off the machines. The the Williams documentary talks about this, um, and they say, you know, they they even say, you know, that Frank got in a plane and and flew to England. What they don't say is that that plane was arranged by Bernie. Bernie took got Frank to England and then denied, you know, having anything to do with it. So. He, he knew nothing about it. He always also denied, you know, helping Tyrrell and Williams. He, you know, giving money out to them. Um, but you know, from uh, even from that Monza accident uh, weekend where Rint has had his accident, he always said he had nothing to do with it. Um, you know, maybe he he loaned them some money at interest, but you know, he had no recollection of it. But back to the story. In those days, there was no TV coverage of Formula One, so there was obviously no TV money. Hence, the teams made money from the races they attended, from sponsorships, and money from drivers. Of course, paid drivers were a thing already. Well, as we talked about, you know, it was very amateurish. No one cared about the money, no one cared about any of the business uh, bits, but they were starting to get expensive, you know, racing was starting to get really expensive. For instance, uh, in those days, Practice could go for nine hours, ten hours. So they started cutting that down a little bit. You couldn't have cars for practice only. Uh, they got qualifying reduced a little bit, so costs started going down. But this was before we really had TV, so no one really complained. You know, if practice instead of being three hours was two or one, so there was, you know, it was it was easier to make that sort of change. Bernie was also uh, using FICA to implement a little bit of track safety. You know, they started getting adequate firefighting equipment, marshals were trained, uh, medical facilities improved a little bit. Eventually, for the uh, Swedish Grand Prix of 78, the, the famous fan car for Brabham race, uh, we got Sid Watkins, Dr. Sid Watkins was on hand and he was now uh, as of the Swedish Grand Prix, he was a permanent fixture. And then eventually, you know, we got helicopters and mobile ICUs and, and things of the sort. And, you know, since Bernie was now actively leading Formula One, you know, the, the whole paddock started getting uh, the same treatment he did with Brabham. You know, parking spaces were organized for the trucks and for people. Um, you know, everyone started dressing up a little bit better, you know, you couldn't have, you know, that, that whole mess of cars and people and equipment everywhere, you know, everything had to be in their place. Uh, for instance, in the Italian Grand Prix of 74, he started handing out paddock passes. Before, basically, you know, you showed up and you got in and everyone was walking around. You know, you, know, you have friends, you have women, you have, you have hanger-ons, and, and, uh, which caused some, some crazy situations, like in the Monaco Grand Prix of uh, 73, a couple of people from the tire company, the tire company couldn't get in because there were so many people already in the pits that they, they didn't want to let anyone in. You know, so Bernie started organizing that. Obviously, the race organizers uh, were not happy. Uh, Monaco, for instance, only subjected itself to Bernie running the, the panic passes in the mid 80s. But eventually, that's, you know, it's the system we have now, you know, Formula One controls who gets in and who doesn't get in, you know, if you want to get in now, you have to pay. Another uh, classic Bernie move, Fika started controlling who was treated as a journalist, which, you know, kind of thinned the herd a little bit, but also gave Fika and, you know, by consequence, Bernie, a little bit more control and power over what happened in the weekend. You know, you say something bad about Bernie, you can bet that you're not getting a pass for the next race. So, you know, Bernie starts kind of controlling who gets in and who gets out. And, you know, his power over the press and, you know, his famous ability to, to start stories where there is no story, you know, this is how he starts. You know, he controls which journalist gets in and you know that if you cross Bernie, you're never getting, getting back in. So. People start behaving. Around this time, Bernie realized that hospitality was another way to make money, 
and he set up a company that was not under his name, but under his control. By the time the 1983 season came around, every single hospitality suite, tent, stand was under his control, and was paying his shell company money for the privilege. For, for instance, uh, there's this uh, famous uh, rally driver, uh, Patrick Mc McNeely. He and, and Bernie had this, this thing that he would set up companies to do what he wanted and put someone else in charge. Uh, Patrick McNeely was hired by Bernie to be a PR consultant and started running this company uh, that he suggested that, you know, they copied what happened at uh, Wimbledon and that's how the Paddock Club was born, still, still going on right now. McNeely is one of the richest men in motorsport. Uh, Bernie ended up buying the company from him and McNally retired with about half a billion pounds um, to his name. So, you know, it's not bad being hired by Bernie or being his friend. At this point, you know, when obviously when uh, Bernie bought the company from McNally in the you know, mid-2000s, he already had more money than he knew what to do with it. But the thing is, you know, with Bernie, it was always the power. You know, once he set up the paddock club, that's more power to him. You know, he can wine and dine the, the high rollers, and you know, there's a place to take the people that he, you know, are, you know, the people that he's interested in. And no one complained because you know they were making more money. Bernie was were, was making money for all of them, more for himself, but you know, it doesn't matter. Uh, for instance, uh, for the Swedish Grand Prix be, became a thing because. Uh, Bernie became friends with one of the Swedish princes. Um, that guy convinced a Japanese company to sponsor the race. You know, obviously uh, he probably got some some favors from the crown and, and, and Sweden or something like that. So you know, he was wheeling and dealing and already you know uh, rubbing shoulders with the powerful. Um, he was you know <laughs> he, he was Bernie. You know. By the mid 1970s, Bernie was firmly in charge, handling all the FICA business with the help of Mosley. He was getting more and more money out of the organizers, and they were starting to get angry. Protests abounded, predictions of the death of Formula One were not uncommon, but Bernie pressed on. The FIA did realize that they were losing control over Formula One, and as Formula One was growing, so they're, they, you know, they're trying to contain the flood, but they just, just couldn't. They, they couldn't handle Bernie. Um, they changed uh, the president of the, the, the CSI, the, the Commission Sportive Internationale, that guy became president of the FIA. Um, then another guy that supplanted him immediately got into a fight with Barney. Oh, and this is, by the way, when uh, a certain Jean-Marie Balestre, uh, that's when he got into the FIA as well. Um, before the 76 season got underway, you know, famous uh, Lauda Hunt uh, season, there was trouble with uh, the race prizes again. You know, FICA wanted more, the organizers felt they were getting fleeced, and, you know, the, this was coming to a head again. So, you know, here comes FIA through the CSI to try to uh, come up with an agreement. And so this, uh, this Frenchman that uh, was now the head of CSI and Balestri and Bernie and Mosley set up to have a talk. And Bernie supposedly, uh, he was so unnerving that Balestri, and Balestri at this point is just assisting the president of the CSI, Apparently, Balestri snaps a finger in half during the meeting just because Bernie was pissing everything, everyone off. And here comes, you know, here's where Bernie's brain comes into play. He realizes that Balestri is a hothead and he would exploit that, you know, for years to come. Obviously, you know, an agreement was reached. Obviously, we had the 76 season. The Fiat FIA, they, they tried to, to get back at Bernie, but, you know, it just didn't matter. Uh, he, <laughs> Bernie ran circles around them. There's a, there's a passage where the, the chairman of the Britain's Royal Automo Automobile Club, uh, he threatened the FIA uh, saying that they were, they were doing a cartel and it, it didn't matter. Uh, you know, no one, no one could, uh, could get past Bernie. But the, the overarching thing here is that Bernie kept his power, he kept getting more money, and there was nothing that the FIA could do about it. So in the space of 25 years or so, Bernie had gone from being a minor participant in Formula 2 races to shaping the political theater of Formula 1 
and running the logistics and hospitality for the entire sport. However, his story is only halfway told, if that. We'll leave the rest of his story for next week, through the war between FISA and FOCA, the introduction of Bernie's arch-rival, and how the man turned F1 into one of the most viewed television events in the world. Thanks again to Flip Jacobson for his excellent recountance of Mr. E. Be sure to subscribe to our show wherever you're listening to this episode to get the conclusion right in your feed. And if you've enjoyed so far, let us know on social media. We're at Garage Easter Radio on Twitter and Instagram. Until then, thanks for listening and take care.